Thanks for joining us for another session of Under the Apple Tree with Bob Kenny. Today, I spend time with Aaron and Andrea, the two founders and owners of the Ash and Elm Cider Company in Indianapolis, Indiana. These guys have been making great cider for over eight years. I hope you enjoy the interview. We'll like the channel and subscribe. Cheers. Thank you for joining another session of Under the Apple Tree with Bob Kenny. Today, I've got the pleasure of spending time with the two owners of the Ashen Elm Cider Company down in Indianapolis, Aaron and Andrea. I appreciate your time and opening the door to me. And um, Cheers. salute. Cheers. Mm, delicious. So tell me a little bit about Ash and Elm and, and where the name came from and why cider in such a big uh, craft beer market. Sure. Well, I'll start. Ash and Elm, we've been open for almost eight years this summer. So we opened in the summer of 2016. Okay. And that was after a couple years of inter internal between the two of us planning and you know preparing to start a company. And uh, the name came from some issues with finding a non-trademarked name. Ooh. And um, <laughs> we had a different name that we kind of were excited about that we, we couldn't use. Um, so in that process of trying to figure out what else would work, we were kind of like brainstorming about things that our families and we liked engaging in outside of work and the woods and hiking and nature is a big part of both of our backgrounds. His dad is a botanist and you know my family spent a lot of time in the outdoors so somehow we stumbled into these two trees, ash trees and elm trees. They felt like they're native to Indiana, apples grow in Indiana. It was kind of like a loose thing because it was really hard, but then we also yeah. liked the way it sounded, and here we are. And then, why cider? How do, uh, what, I know you have a background in wine. What brought you to cider? Yeah, it was, again, kind of a, a long process, but even way back in, uh, in grad school, I started homebrewing beer. I got really into that for several years. Branched out into making wine at home as well, you know, on a very small scale. And, and then... Um, a couple years before we started, just went on a trip uh, to Ireland with some friends. And uh, while driving, just kind of through a part of the country there, stopped for lunch in a little village. Happened to try some cider uh, that was made nearby because it was on the menu. And uh, it was fantastic. It was the first time that I'd had much cider in general. Uh, and definitely the first time I'd had a cider like this that was, you know, completely natural, made from only apples. Uh, had so much more complexity than I was expecting and uh, it kind of blew my mind so having made wine having made beer as soon as I got back home I had to look into how do you make cider and what, what's that all look like and um, just got really fascinated by the possibilities of it the, uh, the newness mm -hmm. especially to me but also to this the US. country kind of in general yep. and, and just the, the diversity that there is in, in apples I had no idea there were thousands of apple varieties out there. Uh, so getting to discover all of that um, has really set me off and being excited about cider. And we're sitting in uh, your restaurant Mm -hmm. And you've got a production facility down the street, and that was the original Ash and Elm location? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So when we opened, we are about half a mile down the road, there's a big warehouse where we do our production. And as we were in planning and looking for where to make our production facility, we were mostly focused on the, the characteristics that would make good for production. So like an overhead door and concrete sure. floors, and we could put in a floor drain and these different things. And we weren't as much thinking of the retail side, but when we found this spot, um, one, it was in our neighborhood, which was great, great. for us. We could walk there. Um, and two, it was owned by the same guy who owned a building next door, which was a historic three-story brick building that had a, a available tenant spot that was like 800 square feet and beautiful archways. And they were looking for a tenant and we were like, well... It's literally next door. They were like two inches apart, so we could even like blow a door in between them. So we, that kind of adjusted our business plan a little bit from being mostly a production cidery to a production and retail okay. spot. Um, and that spot, we were there for five years on the retail side. And during those five years, we were, it was too small multiple times. And we found out about this place half a mile down the road and decided to just move the retail side. So you've been in here now for? Two and a half years. Okay. You've got a pretty, wide variety and I do believe you advertise as the most ciders on draft of any cidery in the state. 
Probably. Be. It's yeah. yeah, McClure's maybe might give us a run for our money. They, they do a lot of at any, at any one time. Yeah. But yeah, in, in general, yeah. who decides what yeah. you're making? At this point, and yeah, how many you know, do you almost, make right now? Almost eight years in, we've got a fairly established system, I guess, okay. how we do what we do. We've got four to five year-round yeah. flagships, if you will, mm -hmm. and then uh, now five seasonal four to five seasonal ones that we rotate through every year. Um, and then we we do a, a cider of the month. So every month we do a new small batch. A couple of those. It's not a small batch anymore. A year and it used to be a, a definitely <laughs> it a small batch. It used to be a small batch, but awesome. it's, These days it's a large it's, batch it's now. It's not so small of a small batch. That's great. Yeah. Um, and so you, know, you add those all up and we do 20 some ciders wow. uh, per year. We edited it up a while ago and we made over 200 unique cider styles. Uh, wow. Since we opened. It's a lot of cider. It's, it's a lot. It's a lot, yeah. yeah. And coming up with those new monthly ones every year now is, is a fun brainstorming process that we do each fall to okay. plan out for the next year ahead. And that's usually me, Aaron, our cider maker, and then we you know, ask our staff in the bar, like, what are people asking for? We ask our production team, do you have any flavors you want to work with? And kind of the three of us consolidate all of that and cross off the ones that don't sound that good and keep the ones that sound great. Awesome. Yeah. And then you, what, experiment a little bit to see what it comes out like? Or Yeah. When I were really small batches, it used to be that the time that we made it was the experiment. Yeah. Uh, and you could yeah. do it that way. But yeah, at this point, since they're pretty, pretty good sized, we uh, will typically do uh, a pilot, small, small batch. Yeah, with, uh, okay. Makes some economic fusion. sense. Yes, yeah. we don't want to lose yeah, a... Absolutely. So much of what we do now is um, really about blending, so yep. we can we can try different blends of things in that pilot phase and then have a pretty good idea of the ratios to scale it up. Okay. Speaking of blending, where do you get your apples? For almost all of the cider that we make, we're getting a, a blend of apples from Michigan. Okay. Um, it'll be a, a different blend of uh, mostly culinary fruit, depending on seasonal availability and things like that. Is that Apple's coming like, out of uh, Michigan as well, the fruit? Oh, some of it. Uh, yeah, some of the other fruit, yeah. Uh, the Cherries. The yeah. Uh, some of the berries come from Indiana or Michigan. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then then when we're doing, you know, something with guava, obviously we're, we're getting purees from from different places. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we really try to keep as much as possible of it very regional. Yeah. yeah. Close by. And then we'll do yeah. some small batches with uh, apples from Indiana. Uh, those are just a little bit harder to, to get the to quantity source. of supply that we want. Yeah. Are you finding it's either more difficult or people are starting to graft and create different styles of apples than you've normally have seen? Because I know grafting has become a really big part of the apple industry from the standpoint of people who yeah. want to use those to make cider, not necessarily being sold in grocery stores. Do you find it either more difficult or easier to find the apples that you want or the, the styles that you want? I would say it hasn't changed a whole lot in Indiana. Okay. Yeah. And it's always been hard. Yeah. Um, we have um, tried to work on that some on our own. So we've got one local orchard that we partner with a lot oh, on cool. the west side. Uh, it's actually where I went to as a kid growing up. <laughs> um, and over the last couple of years, we've worked with them to buy um, about 100 more cider-specific varietal trees. Cool. Got those planted. In another year or two, maybe we'll start seeing a harvest from those. Okay. And, you know, it'll be a really small amount. It'll yeah. be small batch stuff but but um, still it's it's local it's mm -hmm. you're supporting yeah. the economy and uh, exactly yeah, proof of concept maybe yeah, and absolutely yeah we'd love to do that with more. more orchards locally yeah yeah cool. so what's your biggest seller style wise is there what people are coming in looking for or yeah um so fleeting youth is this one i think yep it's our most popular cider. Okay. We're in Indiana. There aren't a lot of other cider producers in the state. Right. And our palate is sweet in Indiana. Okay. That that tends to be the most popular of anything. Even though we personally and our staff probably would would prefer more of like what you're drinking okay. or sure. some of our drier ciders, you can almost graph like the the sweeter the cider, the more residual sugar, the more popular yeah. here in Indiana. So I mean, we we make what our customers want sure. uh, for the most part. Um, so Fleeting Youth is what they want. It's kind of taken off. Um, what is that? It, it's I a saw, raspberry and lemon cider. Yeah, I saw the I saw the description. I was reading. Uh, yeah. It's one of the few we do that actually falls into the sweet category instead okay. of semi-sweet um, or 
or semi-dry or dry. Um, but yeah, it's one thing, like it's too sweet for us to drink that much of personally. Mm -hmm. We always try to make sure even our sweeter, more like fruity ciders have some good balance to them. So we'll cut it with lemon and make sure it's both sweet and tart. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that it's never just like a one note of sweetness. It's It's got some complexity even when it's a sweeter style. Obviously the the world thinks that cider is made by the big guy in New York. There's so many people say, I don't drink cider because it's too sweet. Mm -hmm. How do we educate people that cider doesn't have to be that uh, sugar bomb that you're mm -hmm. finding um, in a lot of sh grocery store shelves that'll be you know, the dominant brand that, that's mm -hmm. on there? I think so much of that falls to the, s the regional and state cider producers like us that are making those options. And then we kind of feel like it's our job to to educate the Indiana consumer, or at least mm -hmm. the Indianapolis consumer about that. And we do that through lots of different ways. One, having a, a tasting room where people can come in and we can actually talk to them. But we have a big farmer's market program and we yeah. go to seven or eight farmer's markets every Saturday throughout the state. And oh, wow. at each of them, we sample all of our ciders to anyone who wants to try it. In my mind, even if they don't buy it, it's at least starting the conversation that, oh, maybe maybe it's a little different than I thought. I think the, the best way to do it is just to get more people to try it. Anything that a small producer like us or a regional producer could do to actually get their cider into people's mouths is, I think, how you have to start. There's a, a line about liquid to lips. Exactly. Um, and, and really, I totally 100% agree that yeah. because people's perception is so warped yeah. by the big guy um, that's out there that is so sweet. It will it will drive me crazy when I go to like a beer festival or a sampling and I'm literally giving away alcohol and people will be like, I'm not going to like it. Yeah. And yeah. I'll just say, what yeah. harm will it do? Yeah. It is free, sir. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Please, Absolutely. I beg of you to just try it. I don't care if you don't like it, but just try it. And usually, you know, if you're like a little disarming when you do it, they'll be like, okay, fine. And yeah. then they'll be like, ah, actually, that's not that bad. And you're like, great. Surprise, Thank you very surprise. much. Yeah. Have a good time at the next festival. Uh, but you festival. also do a festival, right? Yeah. We have. Yep, we have a, um, we started it in 2022, our Autumn Tidings Fall Festival, and that is a, a celebration of the apple in Indiana and the producers that make cider in Indiana because we're the largest, but there are several others throughout the state that um, that are making great ciders. So we kind of invite all of us together to expose them to our customers and to the Indianapolis crowd because there aren't as many of them here locally. Is it a street fest or how does it? Um, it's at a venue. Oh, okay. It's an outdoor venue um, okay. called Monon 30 and we had almost 2,000 people come this last year so it's it's really popular and we also we bring some beer vendors because we want people to come sure. and but we also bring our orchards. Friends. Yeah our friends in the in the <laughs> industry yeah, no. but we bring some orchards and have apples for sale and pumpkins for sale and kind of make it like a fall orchard. Great. Family fest? I mean, it is family friendly and yeah. dog friendly and it's okay. a lot of fun and there's a lot of cider that gets consumed at that festival mm -hmm. so Excellent. yeah it's good Excellent. yeah and again, again that to me that's another great way to yeah. put the liquid across people's lips at exactly a, at an event like that it's kind of like what's it called cider fest or whatever in chicago mm -hmm. uh, a couple weeks cider ago summit. Uh, a couple thousand people i guess rolled through there yeah um, someday we'll be at that a lot of interesting ciders yeah i'm uh, sure very interesting we're up there now tell me a little bit about the other styles that you're making i see a Plum Snow Day and uh, Chai, and you mentioned the youth, and I can't see the name of the last one, but... Wayfinder. Is, yeah, Wayfinder. Just like a classic, semi-sweet, apple-only okay. cider. We, a lot of times, will think about this one as sort of our gateway cider. Okay. If, if you are either completely new to the concept of cider, or maybe all you've had and, and what you've liked is, is something uh, like from one of the big national yeah. players, this is going to be kind of similar. Less sweet, more complex, more balanced, we think. But, uh, Hits the same notes. Yeah. Okay. An yeah. easy way Up, in. Easy upgrade. Point of reference, yeah. yeah. Um, then the, uh, the Marigold Chai here is one of our seasonal ones. We do this in the winter. winterish. Spiced, style. okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's uh, another semi sweet cider infused with a blend of uh, different. 
for chai spices. And then the Sugar Plum Snow Day was one of our uh, ciders of the month for December. Um, this one's actually been very popular and we're going to make it be uh, a seasonal, bigger. a Christmas yeah. seasonal well, or well, holiday really seasonal. Especially with snow on it, it's a seasonal. <laughs> you would hope so. It. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And the ones that we're looking at here that now this is a, obviously a sample board uh, yeah. with four different ciders on it. Yeah, yeah we do a, a, a lot of flights again yeah, to you know, which give people an experience with awesome. um, a lot of things that maybe are new to them. These uh, look the same to you, but uh, this first one here that uh, we've both been drinking a little bit of, we call ESD, um, sort of a naming play on uh, the ESB. beer style ESB. Okay. Um, but it stands for Extra Special Dry. This is um, a, a totally dry, no residual sugar cider. This is one of the few ones that we do usually make with Indiana apples. Okay. And we'll also do a little bit of a malolactic fermentation on this to give it a bit more smooth, less less acidic okay. uh, balance. The next one here is our uh, semi-dry flagship. Uh, it can be similar in many ways to the, the Wayfinder, but less sweet, more wine-like, uh, a little bit crisper. In its name? I'll just call that one dry for now. But, uh, <laughs> okay. There's uh, some trademark issues yeah. with that one at this exact moment, so right. we'll call it dry for right now. Yeah, I got you. <laughs> the next one is we call Headlong. This one we've been making since we started out. It's dry hopped with a, a blend of different hops, including citra hops. Um, this one is a, a nice gateway for the beer drinker, sure. somebody who likes IPAs. And yeah. it is not semi-sweet, it's semi-dry, so yeah, it's also okay. a nice drier one with a, like a little floral, citrusy aroma. Yeah. That's really nice. When you smell it, you think it, you're having an IPA, but then you, you don't get any of the bitterness. Interesting. Um, mm -hmm. And then the last one is something we just call barrel aged. This is a, a really small batch thing that we do just in the, the tasting room here. Um, it's a, a blend of cider from a few different barrels that we have hanging out over production. Mostly whiskey barrels, but uh, some rum barrels. Uh, we've also got some cool uh, French uh, Calvados barrels. Oh. Excellent. Got a little bit of stuff in there. So this one's also higher ABV, um, also very dry. Yeah. Now, um, on your aging, is it aged mostly in stainless, or do you have a series of yeah wood, like you mentioned, or oak? The vast majority of what we do is just going to be in stainless. Okay. Um, not a whole lot of aging time. Where we're adding additional fruits or spices, we do kind of a secondary ferment to age, uh, aging together in stainless there. So pretty much uh, just the, the barrel aged here would be the only thing that I think is uh, wood aged. Okay. Uh, what yeah. we've got out here. And depending on what exactly we're making and which barrels that's in, it could be anywhere from as little as maybe a month to a couple of years. Seriously, yeah? You hold it for that? Wow. Usually <laughs> the sweet spot we find is more than kind of six nine, nine months. months. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just get enough of that flavor yeah. from the wood there. Yeah, it could be cider. It could be overpowering pretty easily. So also, yeah. they're used barrels. So tired, less and less. Yeah, and we'll use them multiple times. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Hard to get them? Not these days. Okay. Um, especially the, the whiskey bourbon barrels. You, as you may know, uh, with bourbon, they can only use them once. Right. So they, bourbon. You usually um, have been sending them to Scotland afterwards. Yeah. But now the brewers have gone after. Now there's so many local distillers as well that. Um, That's a good point. Yeah. You've got a lot of, of, of yeah. friends. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Just text them and ask for. And got any barrels? Run awesome. them over to us. So. Well, a lot of times we'll give them back, and then maybe they'll do something, something with it. Wow. You know, yeah. As you sit here, eight years in, what do you see in the cider world? What, what's mm. is it growing? It, yeah, I know it's growing. I know the craft side of it is growing. Mm -hmm. Anyways, you know what's it look like to you guys? What's the future consumer that you're trying to reach out to? It's really interesting to me because being in the Midwest in a not really big cider area, the trends that we see our peers in the cider industry talking about haven't hit us yet, and they won't still for several years, at least historically. What so, type of trends? Uh, you know, at CiderCon recently, they were talking about the Gen Z drinker and what okay. they want, and you know, they want either really high ABV or really low ABV. That kind of middle of the road thing isn't as much what they're going for. They want a Asian okay. drinking yep. and all of that I think we see it seems to 
like <laughs> they feel stressed about it because they're dealing with it now and they're seeing it impact their their sales now okay. and I feel fine about it because I see what they're going to do and then I'll just do that when sure. it starts to affect <laughs> right, us right. so and let them, and, let them, yeah, let them the figure headaches. it out and yeah, then sure. implement the best things yeah, I sure. see um, so that's one of the things um, there's a lot of talk about like the diversifying customer and like what different segments of the population like to drink I had a really interesting conversation with a woman named Maria Kennedy who is out in Ithaca I want to say is she in Ithaca Finger Lakes area she's not a cider maker but she's a researcher and she was saying at least for her demographic there the people who like cider are kind of like anti-capitalist anti-establishment like sticking it to the man by drinking this esoteric strange foraged (laughs) beverage and I was like that is not our customer (laughs) our customer is a Taylor Swift fan you know and like it's just a very different you know we're millennial women here in Indianapolis Um, and we've you know expanded outside of that a little bit but that's the biggest group for us and so it is it is interesting that there can be so much variety within this category from you know people who are trying to make a point with what they consume to people who are just like I'll drink anything that's that tastes like how I want whether it's beer or wine or cocktail or whatever Um, I think the the trend for people to be flavor focused instead of segment focused is great for us because we make ciders that are flavor forward. Yeah, I think it's a very interesting time. On on one hand, I see a lot of parallels between where cider, and especially craft cider, is at right now and where craft beer was at maybe 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, you had sort of a, an early boom of, of craft beer, and all the, like microbreweries and, and things like that in the 90s or early 2000s or some brands, and then it kind of reinvented itself a little bit and had mm-hmm. The, the explosion of twenty ten ish people everywhere and uh, a million different IPA styles and yeah. things like that. And I think in some ways cider is in that period of it had a little bit of a boom a few years ago. It became a thing that people actually knew existed, mm-hmm. and uh, and we've been a part of some of that growth. And then now it's starting to have this sort of second phase of all the big huge brands are maybe shrinking a little bit or being replaced by regional brands or newer smaller players and uh, people are discovering uh, maybe a more interesting more complex version of cider um, and so I, I hope that that continues to play out and we have the next second phase larger a really big boom and it could become more mainstream uh, people are again talking at cider con about who's the cider drinker yeah. and I kind of buy into the argument that there is no cider drinker there's it's none and all there is no beer drinker there's no wine drinker anymore the future of cider is going to be people who are not just cider drinkers they're everybody else they're mm-hmm. also beer drinkers they're also oh, wine drinkers and they're just part of your part of their selection yeah, it's, it's not going to be always their selection yeah, yeah and exactly. that's fine exactly. yeah that pie, that market share is so, so much bigger than sure. this little thing of... Uh, I only drink cider. Trying to yeah. to yeah. pigeonhole people into being exclusive. Well, I, I think cider was growing very nicely and get almost a double whammy with uh, Celsius and then mm-hmm. pandemic. You know, now the, the bloom is off the salsa thing, finally. Yeah, thank finally. God. <laughs> it's on to RTDs, and where is it going to go after that? Who knows? But I do think that cider's position is a, we'll call it a healthier alcohol style. I mean, mm-hmm. gluten-free piece of it is, is huge. The size of the grocery store shelves that are now gluten-free, it's gigantic. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think there's a lot of really, really positive aspects of, of what cider brings to the table that maybe people aren't aware of. And, mm-hmm. and it's the education part, and whether it's the, the tasting in a room like this, or the festivals, or the uh, farmer's markets, those are the things that, that have to continue to continue to let people know what it's all about. Um, yeah. It's a wonderful drink. And I, I just think yeah. that, you know, it was, to go back to the old days, before Prohibition, it was the number one alcohol in the country, mm-hmm. is cider. Everybody in the world had cider. And you'd love to see it come back, you know, to that point. It would take a long time to get there, but yeah. how do you guys market it at retail? Ooh, that's a good question. Because that, to me, is a hard thing. You know, yeah. you, you can't be at, obviously, every store, every location, or whatever, but... How do you get that consumer to know that cider is here? Um, I I don't think we've really had to delve into it too much because we've been only in Indiana we, okay. and we've had this kind of slow organic growth. So, but you do have a distributor. Yep, we have yep. a distributor. We're in like most of the Kroger's in the state. So like 
I think for us, our story is that we make a product that we think is really good and really consistent, and then we're really active in the community and in the city. So I think for us, we haven't had to really step into fighting for our placements mm -hmm. yet because we've been focused on just Indiana and it started with central Indiana then slowly grew to the state. So the things that we have done to, to make sure our sales please the powers that be and they keep ordering and expanding us uh, on their shelves are quality product that is consistent. Branding, we have spent a lot of time and energy thinking about like what the logo looks like and the colors and the design so that they're eye catching on the shelf and who and, does it for you? Um, well, it started with a woman named Amy McAdams. She okay. designed the original logo and the original brand. And then after a few years, she had to take on bigger projects. And we switched over to a guy who just works for us on retainer. His name is Khalid. Oh, cool. So he does additional stuff as we need it. Yep. The two of them have both been great. And also being active in the community in Indiana and Indianapolis, by being at all of these farmers markets, by just raising the awareness of our brand specifically, when someone goes into Kroger and they see it on the shelf, they're going to buy it because they're like, I just saw them at this yeah. festival I was at or at the farmer's market this morning. So I think that really focusing on getting the awareness of your community out will lead to those things, but it takes a while. You also do a lot inside the community, right? Yeah, you we do. We a lot of support. Yeah, we do. Groups. We have, we're very well loved in Indianapolis, which is like, <laughs> like as a company, even people who don't like cider feel loved by us and welcomed by us. And that's something that we really, again, and put a lot of intentional thought into how our space feels and who we want to feel welcome here. And the answer was everybody. And a lot of the people that don't feel welcome walking into a brewery, um, we want them to walk in here and be like, ah, oh, finally, a yeah. spot for me. And I think that comes across because it's authentic. But there are organizations mm. that you guys support as well, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, um, so, pretty good yeah, a pretty good list. Like Donation requests yeah. constantly. Uh, any nonprofit who's ever had an idea of a fundraiser has reached out to us, so we get many every day. Over time, we decided to go bigger with fewer partners yep. um, so that we can be more impactful with those specific ones. And one of the ones that we really partner with is called IYG Indiana Youth Group. And it is a nonprofit that provides safe spaces for members of the queer community, um, especially young people. Cool. So like they provide housing and showers and like it's it's kind of like a, a community center for people who are homeless or struggling at home with their identity. And so we do a cider in June every year for Pride called okay. Purple Gaze cool. and percentage of the proceeds of that go to support IYG. And that has become kind of big in Indy. Um, it's at every gay bar for Pride and like the more we well, sell of it. Big here. I mean, there's a yeah. big parade and everything. Yep, still yep. Right? The more we sell of it, the more we give to them awesome. and awesome. the deeper that connection is gone. Okay. Yeah, and then one of the other organizations we've kind of gone on a deeper partnership with is called Gang Gang and they're a cultural enterprise that tries to support black and brown arts in the city of Indianapolis and cultural events. And so really I care about people who who don't feel like they've had their space. Yeah. And yeah. so so how can how can I use this company with cider to elevate those people awesome. and those those nonprofits that are doing like the direct work of that group, those groups. So that's something I care a lot about and that's what brings me joy in this job, which, you know, is customer service, retail, manufacturing, not always the most joyful yeah. place to work. I see 12 ounce cans. Are you exclusively in draft that way or do you to other packaging or we have kept it very simple on the, the package formats uh, okay. so far um, just 12 ounce cans four packs and then draft half barrels and six barrels okay. it's kind of what we've always always done, done. Yep. every once in a while when we get like access to really quality apples or you know Aaron once during COVID foraged a bunch of crab apples around the neighborhood because what else are you going to do yeah, during COVID absolutely. every once in a while we'll do like a very limited run of like a hundred bottles and a 750, okay, 750 that will sell sure. out of here but that is few and far between you see, you're starting to see more of that you know but i know obviously yeah. the can 12 and 16s are the dominant package nowadays as well as draft. yeah and we went back and forth on 12 versus 16 a lot at the beginning but we just felt like with the price point when we're using all fruit real yep. everything and when indiana doesn't have a lot of knowledge about cider 
you can't sell a 16 ounce four pack for you know fifteen dollars yeah. people aren't going to buy it so the price drove a lot of that so what do you want to tell me about you guys that that, that the world should know about ashton elm uh, i think one thing that is interesting about us or that is on my mind a lot is the online mm. side of cider yep. uh, their wine clubs, those are kind of an established way of purchasing wine that people know about. Mm -hmm. It's still kind of the wild, wild west for online cider clubs. And we we have one, we have for a few years. We're one of the bigger cider clubs online, I think, though I don't have... Four times a year or so, or do you come out with... We have two versions, so we have okay. a quarterly one and a monthly one. And you can ship to how many states? About 40. Awesome. 40, 41, somewhere around there. And I think that that's something really interesting for us as we think about our company growing like how do we become the biggest cider club and what does that look like and how do we become the athletic brewing of cider I mean yeah they're they're amazing and obviously we have constraints we're alcohol you know it's not not alcohol that's something that kind of gets my gears going because I like to be the first person to try and figure out how to do something or early on and trying to figure that out you know obviously the wineries have figured that out yeah um, and a lot of it I believe comes from the experience you have visiting the winery, mm -hmm. have a wonderful time. Hey, sign up for our club, and you yep. know, whether you want it or not, yeah, you inevitably do. Yeah. And I think that that's you know something you guys through here mm -hmm. uh, have a great opportunity. Yeah, and we probably could be doing well. more of that, honestly, like making sure to ask every customer, like, hey, yeah. are you from here? If not, do you want to Absolutely. sign up for our club? Sign up. Um, People do it, but not like everyone every time. Strategic. You know, I don't know how many cideries there are in the state of Indiana. Half a dozen? Fourteen. Okay. Fourteen licensed cideries. How many okay. of them actually produce regular cider? Yeah, I don't sure, know some about. Are a little seasonal. Yeah. Um, or they're more like a winery that has one cider that yes. they do here and there. Yeah. Yeah. I think well, a lot Oliver, of them are that. I was that. shocked to see Oliver making yeah. cider. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's a longer term play to make mm -hmm. that work. But I wholeheartedly agree that if you could continue to get people to sign up to the mail project, uh, mm -hmm. the cider club would be, be an interesting. Be, yeah. Very interesting nut to crack. But yeah, I think that, that those are parts of uh, Liquid Over Lips, and, mm -hmm. and that's how to do it, and people are in here having a wonderful time, and yeah. they're really enjoyable. Will you have a big crowd for St. Patrick's Day? We will not. We no? Okay. no, because about the biggest crowd in the city goes a few blocks down to, okay. um, what's it called? The Golden Ace. Golden Ace. Okay. Um, who did just reach out about carrying our cider. Awesome. So way to go, Mariana. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, they have a huge thing that people come to town. So we're always dead on, okay. on St. Patrick's very, Day. Very old Irish. Man. I remember the okay. very first St. Patrick's Day we had when we were open. We'd been open for like nine months or something. I was like, this is going to be huge. I'm renting a costume. I'm going to like uh, dance as a leprechaun and we're going to dye our cider. And like nobody came. And I was like, uh... <laughs> Fail. Side, did you actually? We die? didn't. Okay. No, we talked about lots of things. I didn't actually bring the costume either, but I should have. <laughs> it was big talk, <laughs> and then no one came. <laughs> yeah, stand outside, right? Yeah, I should have. Yeah. For some just, reason, St. Patrick's Day is not our. Not it's our it's not our yeah, holiday. Sure. Yeah, we have other ones that are very busy, just not that one. Is there a an official cider month? October. Now. Shillings yeah. in um, Portland and Seattle yeah. Yeah. are trying to make October the National sure. Cider Month. Month, and they partnered with Whole Foods. So last year was the first year they oh, wow. did it, and Whole Foods did it. We were involved with it here, and the first year went so well that I think they're really excited about what it could grow awesome. into. Yeah. Okay. Yep. It's supported, obviously, by ACA. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and I imagine probably even more so this year. Now yeah. It's kind of yeah. Now Foods that it's been tested awesome. a little. Yeah. yeah. The the main buyer for Whole Foods gave a speech about how she thinks cider is like. She's very excited about cider over the next few years. Okay, so. Sorry. That was that was really cool. In, in, yeah. In one of the cider magazines about yeah. her and the size yes. of the cider doors that she has. Mm -hmm. on They've kind of committed to cider mm -hmm. in a way that a lot of people haven't, and it's well, been successful. That whole idea of good for you. Yep. Yep. Um, and they can't sell liquor, so they're not, people shopping at Whole Foods aren't choosing between a seltzer and a cider. They're picking here. cider or beer here. here. That's true. That's a good point. <laughs> oh, right. I forgot about those pesky state laws. That, that way everywhere. <laughs> With the cideries that are here, are you guys all friends and do you guys all get along? Yeah. Um, I'm going to steal yeah. a little bit of this. Barrel aged. Barrel aged, yeah. Okay. 
we are spa spaced out enough geographically mm -hmm. that I would say we don't get together a whole lot or have a lot of, of communication, but um, that's one of the things that also drew us to the cider industry. I think in general throughout this country, the spirit of, of collaboration, mm -hmm. helping each other out. I mean, it's a new growing thing, so we sure. have that, that mindset. And we've also had that with the breweries not, locally. Yeah, the non-cider people around here. Um, it's been really... We've been very fortunate to have so many breweries that yeah. have helped us out when we were getting started or that are still... Will they carry a cider at their places? Oh, That's yeah. Awesome. That's yeah. Some of our biggest yeah. customers are the... Awesome. Like, every brewery in town has one draft line of our cider. It's great. Yeah, again, Not giving, everyone, but giving, giving most their, of them. Uh, is there somebody there who is gluten free again? Yeah, or exactly. Just a, sure. Like beer that's part of the crowd. Yep. It's a great alternative. On the uh, camaraderie, I think our fall festival, like doing that for a couple years now, has made at least me more connected to our local cider community yeah. Yeah. because yeah. I'm working with them to help them. I'm buying their product and supporting them. And so I think that where they may have before been like, oh, Ash and Elm is, is coming into Fort Wayne. I don't, they're going to ruin our company. I don't think they feel like that. But at least now they know us and know sure. that we're like, no, we're trying to elevate all of us. We want all of us to be bigger than we are a year ago. Um, so I think that has helped us feel more like a community, too. Yeah, it is something, what did I have? Last I saw, it was like 1,300 or so mm -hmm. cideries in the country. Yep. Yeah, representing less than 1% of the alcohol consumed. Mm -hmm. I mean, the upside is gigantic. But if you go back to where the craft brewers were in the 80s, uh, the guys I worked for, I think they were the class of 88. I think there were 15 of them mm. uh, that started that year. And now there's a little less than 10,000 craft breweries. Yeah, that's wow. way too many. It's crazy. Mm. It is yeah. crazy how big they got. The, the potential is there. Yeah. yeah. No, the, the upside's the there. The upside's possibilities are there. That's for sure. From a standpoint of your can business versus draft, what's the percentages of uh, you selling on draft? From a, from a production standpoint, it's mm. about 70-30, 70% 70 can, cans, 30% okay. draft. Um, majority of what we distribute is in cans, uh, and then of course we sell a decent amount of them here. We do a lot of carry, carry out, out can business out of this place, and then oh, so you can all the online stuff, like stuff as well. Right yeah. Um, so it, it's a, it's a big part for us. Um, I'd like to see the draft part grow a little bit more, honestly. Always. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's huge. In, in Indianapolis, besides you guys, are there is there another cider maker in the city? Not in the city so. anymore. There nope. used to be um, a company called New Day that. Uh, was nearby that did mostly mead but also cider okay. but they've been out of business for a few years now there's another somebody in Bloomington right yep friendly beasts yeah, in Bloomington, Bloomington. Yeah, no, and there's another one starting in Bloomington as well yeah and then there's um, Kekianga and Ambrosia Orchards in Fort Wayne um, McClure's uh, McClure's in Peru which is north about an hour or so from here uh, it's an orchard based they're okay. one, they one of the uh, original yeah uh, we talked to them when Indiana, we were in planning. Okay. Cider makers. Is, is there a cider assessing issue? In no. I thought about it, but I don't know. Uh, One, I have a lot on my a lot, a lot on my work. plate already, yeah. but sure. but I do feel like it's something that could could be good because if we were just a part of the Brewers Association, which we can be, the laws that we want to fight for are so different. different. Like absolutely, uh, it's just a totally different <laughs> business model and priorities. Yeah. And and legal classifications that it just doesn't make sense really. Um, I'm glad they include us in some of their stuff, but they're not going to advocate the, for the same things we would necessarily. No, no, so yeah, and, we need to. I mean to finally get some of the taxes, tax right. relief, yeah, on the CO2 and all those wonderful things. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's crazy how it's regulated. I know. Like, it's like way too many steps. It's mm -hmm. just so inconsistent. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's 50 different it's rules for 50 different states, too, mm -hmm. which is a crazy well, yeah, yeah. On top of that. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah, maybe well, someday, but we're just, uh, there's not, still not that many of us in the cider world here. So. Yeah. Well, you could, you could be the king. We could be. <laughs> I like being the king, but... <laughs> <laughs> but there's work, as yeah. always, and I'm sure yeah. legislative work and everything else that goes along with this. Yeah. This has been absolutely wonderful for me. I thank you for oh, opening good. the door. Yeah. Well, I hope you enjoyed that interview. And we'll join us again for the next segment of Under the Apple Tree with Bob Kenny when we visit another one of our great American cideries. Don't forget to like the channel and subscribe. Cheers.